This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Professor William Sandy Darity is taking your questions. He'll be talking about the African-American economy. Professor Darity tackles controversial topics in his scholarship, including wealth disparities, the financial practices of black Americans, the achievement gap, reparations, and workplace discrimination. Here at Duke, he is the Arts and Sciences Professor of Public Policy and African and African American Studies. He also has an appointment in the Department of Economics. He is the author of a number of books, including Boundaries of Clan and Color, Transnational Comparisons of Intergroup Disparity. He is the editor-in-chief of the International Encyclopedia of the Social Sciences. And this semester at Duke, he is teaching two courses, Racial and Ethnic Inequality Across National Perspective and Race, Ethnicity, and Social Policy. On top of all that, Professor Darity also plays blues harmonica. To ask a question of Professor Darity, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Darity, we're at your office hours today, and we already have two questions by email. They're on the same topic. One comes from David and one comes from Mike, and it's about news out this morning about new unemployment figures and estimated 263,000 jobs lost in December, a national unemployment rate approaching 10%. And David and Mike ask, how do these figures impact different ethnic groups differently? Okay, well, historically in the United States, uh, particularly in all the data that we've gathered since World War II, uh, the unemployment rate for black Americans has generally been twice as high as the unemployment rate for white Americans. And the figures that were just released this morning from the Bureau of Labor Statistics are fairly consistent with that pattern. And of course, the higher the overall national unemployment rate, the more dramatic the rise in the black unemployment rate. So uh, if we look at today's figures, we find that the overall unemployment rate is 9.8%. Uh, I keep having this sense that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is doing its best to avoid having the statistic be reported at the 10% level, where we would have then a double-digit unemployment rate. But at 9.8%, it is safe to say still, one out of 10 Americans who are looking for work are out of work. Um, that's fairly dramatic. But the unemployment rate for African Americans in that same context is closer to 16% and it's about 13% for Latinos in the United States. I've argued that that differential in unemployment rates uh, is an index of the degree of discrimination in the society. And I, I want to reinforce that by uh, providing you with some data that I brought uh, to office hours to share. Uh, one of the things that we know is that uh, blacks with college degrees have about the same unemployment rate as whites with a high school diploma. Blacks with high school degrees have about the same unemployment rate as whites who drop out of high school. And among teenagers, the black teen unemployment rate is almost twice as high as the white teen unemployment rate, where the black teen unemployment rate is about 41%, and the white teen unemployment rate is 23.2%. And to go further to emphasize the discriminatory dimension in this process, uh, I want to point in particular to a study by Diva Pager that was performed uh, about four years ago where she discovered that the odds of getting a job are greater for a white male with a criminal record than they are for a black male who does not have a criminal record at similar levels of education. Professor Darity, we have already have another question here. This one comes from Facebook from Stuart McGeady, and he says, economists Walter Williams and Thomas Sewell might question you. In this day and age, how is it possible to distinguish an African-American economy from an American economy? Okay. Well, uh, there's, there's actually an interesting sidebar on, on this question. Uh, the other day, I was at the uh, Fuqua Business School having lunch, and uh, a graduate student came up to me and said, uh, uh, are you Thomas Sowell? And, uh, and I was a little startled. Uh, I never thought 
of the possibility that I would ever be mistaken for Thomas Sowell. Uh, but my, my response was, well, no, I'm not Thomas Sowell, and he and I live in different worlds. Uh, but, uh, but with respect to this particular question, uh, if Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams would question whether or not there is a separate African-American economy, I'm not certain that I would disagree with them. And, and maybe we should have called this online office hours something closer to uh, the current economic crisis and the well-being of the African-American community rather than ask about the African-American economy. Uh, I think one could argue that there was an African-American economy, a separate operating African-American economy that uh, existed during the period of Jim Crow or legal segregation in the United States. But I think it's harder to make that claim now. Uh, so indeed, I'm not sure we can talk about a separate African-American economy. And uh, furthermore, uh, in terms of my own research on questions concerning wealth and ownership disparities, I think that the whole process of thinking about uh, separate black businesses is quite complicated and tricky in light of the huge disparities in the size, magnitude, and sphere of operations of black-owned and white-owned operations. For example, um, in 2007, the top 200 black-owned firms identified by Black Enterprise magazine, these were the 100 leading auto dealers and 100 leading industrial service dealers collectively, grossed a total of $27 billion. That's in 2007. Firms ranking in the 50s and 60s on the Fortune 500 list, like Delphi, Prudential, Merrill Lynch, DuPont, Walt Disney, Motorola, and Pepsi, uh, actually some of these don't still exist, uh, each grossed at least as much as all of the 200 black businesses taken together in 2004. And the top firm, Walmart, stores grossed $258 billion, almost 10 times the amount of all of the top 200 black-owned firms combined, and more than one-fourth of black America's entire purchasing power. So I, I think there is a, a valid question here as to whether or not we can really think about there being a separate African-American economy of any, of any substance. But I think, again, that's a reflection of these huge disparities in wealth and resources that exist across our population based on race. Everyone watching is invited to ask Professor Darity a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Darity, you've been mentioning wealth, and in a lot of your analysis, you're looking at wealth as opposed to income. Can you explain that, the difference of looking at wealth versus income? Yeah, so income is a flow of resources that individuals or families or households receive. Usually the major source of income is uh, individuals or household earnings. Uh, whereas wealth, in contrast, is a stock of assets that individuals or households own various types of property uh, that n are not necessarily transformed immediately into income. And so this could include real estate, uh, your, your residential home. This could include stocks, bonds, and other types of equities. <coughs> it could, it could ex include commercial land property. It could include a business that an individual owns. Um, and I, I would argue that the significance of wealth is that it provides people with uh, a variety of insurances. Uh, it, provides, uh, it provides a source of resources that can, that can be appropriated in time of medical emergency or other types of emergency expenses. It can ensure that individuals have the capacity to uh, purchase better health, better education, better schooling. <coughs> Excuse me. It also enables individuals uh, to exercise various kinds of influence within their community, political influence and the like. So, uh, so wealth really has uh, a, a tremendous amount of, of purchase as a source of, of, of power and status that uh, is not really associated with the kind of, of, of payoff that you get from income. Um, and so 
Uh, I've focused a lot of my research on examining the, the huge disparities that exist in, in wealth by race uh, as a consequence of, of the importance that I have increasingly found one has to ascribe to wealth. Viewers are invited to join in this office hours conversation. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Darity, you and your colleague Derek Hamilton have made a pretty radical proposal in addressing these wealth disparities. Baby bonds. What are baby bonds? Okay. Well, maybe it would be also helpful for me to, 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 uh, to give the listeners a uh, a sense of what the magnitude are magnitude is of these disparities that we've been talking about. Um, so if, if I was to go back to 2002 uh, and look at the estimates that were provided by the Survey of Income and Program Participation, uh, I'd find that uh, the median white household had a wealth position of a measured net worth of $90,000. Uh, the median Latino household would have a wealth position at the median of $8,000, and the median African American household's wealth position was a mere $6,000. To give you a sense of how staggering those differences are, the median black or Latino household would have to save 100% of their annual income for three consecutive years to close the gap between their wealth position and that of the typical white household's wealth position. So these are huge disparities. Um, in fact, I think approximately 85 to 90 percent of all black households have a wealth position that is below the median for the median white household. Uh, well, <coughs> Derek Hamilton, who's on the faculty at New School in, in New York, and I uh, were thinking about ways in which we could address this without having a race-targeted program, since apparently at this moment in American history, race-targeted programs are not particularly popular. Uh, and in fact, we thought that a program might actually gain more momentum, weight, and, and enthusiasm if it was one that would reach all Americans uh, regardless of race, and so we began to think about the development of a program that could be directed at the children, the newly born children, of families that we describe as being wealth poor. So a wealth poor family would be one whose, uh, whose wealth position or net worth falls below the median for all Americans. So we would take all of those households <coughs> examine whether or not they have a newborn child during a given year, and if that newborn child is uh, a member of a family that is wealth poor, we would give that child a trust fund. <coughs> Excuse me, a federally provided trust fund. We call this a baby bond. Okay, and this federally provided trust fund would be graduated, so that the more distant the family is, below the median for all. American households with, or families with respect to wealth, the higher the trust fund amount that would be assigned to the newborn infant. So at the, uh, for those infants that are born into families in the very lowest quartile of the wealth distribution, <coughs> we would give them a trust fund that would be in the amount of fifty to sixty thousand dollars. And we would reduce that amount as families get closer and closer to, to the median. Um, and we think that this would be a very, very interesting and effective way to try to address the staggering wealth inequalities that exist in the society. And, and there's some other dimensions to our proposal. <coughs> Kids would not be able to access this trust fund until they reach uh, 18 years of age. And then there's the possibility of, of placing some limitations or restrictions on the ways in which this trust fund could be used. Perhaps it could be restricted in part to uh, educational expenses and the like. <coughs> but, that's, but that's the basic idea of the trust fund. And I'm sorry, I keep coughing, but uh, we'll try and stagger through. Professor Darity, when you're talking about these baby bonds in this transfer of wealth, is this a kind of reparations? Well, uh, if, if you ask me in the abstract 
what my preference would be in terms of how to address the racial disparity in wealth, I would say, let's introduce a reparations program. But at this particular moment, historically, even the President of the United States, who is an African American, is opposed to reparations. <coughs> so as a consequence, uh, we thought that we should try to develop an alternative program that is not a reparations program. I, I, don't, I don't call the baby bond a reparations program. <coughs> it's not targeted or directed specifically at African Americans or any other ethnic or racial group that's been subjected to deep injustice. It really addresses the broader range of injustices that are associated with wealth inequality for all Americans. And so it's, it's not a reparations program. It is a redistribution program, but not a reparations program. Another issue you think, <coughs> Professor Darity, is financial literacy. And uh, you've not shied away from controversy here. You've taken issue with something that Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke said in a speech this year at Morehouse College, challenging his assertion that low wealth in the black community comes from a lack of financial literacy. So what's your, what's your argument there? Uh, my argument there is that uh, once you control for family or household income, you don't see any significant difference in the financial practices of black and white uh, families or households. Uh, I think specific, I'm thinking specifically of a study that was done by Maurice Gittleman and Ed Wolf that was published in the Journal of Human Resources in 2004, where they find that after you take into account income, uh, household savings rates are not different between blacks and whites. In fact, within the same income strata, you actually have some evidence that blacks have a slightly higher savings rate than whites. Uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, it's not a question of differential portfolio management. Uh, the rates of returns on assets are pretty much the same for blacks and whites after you adjust for income. <coughs> so these huge disparities that we observe, this, uh, this gap between a $90,000 median white household wealth position and a $6,000 African American median wealth position <coughs> can't be attributed to savings and financial practices. It has to be attributed largely to the transmission of resources across generations in two forms, inheritances and what we technically call in vivo transfers. <coughs> Again, excuse me. Um, inheritances are those transfers that occur across generations when uh, an elder family member or relative dies, and in vivo transfers are those that occur across generations while the elder generation is still living. And they take a variety of forms, could include the funds that parents provide, <coughs> to assist their sons and daughters in attending Duke University. Um, it could include the money that's given from parents to their sons or daughters at the point in which their children purchase a home to help them make the mortgage payment. It could include a trust fund that they set up for their sons and daughters' children at, their, at, the, at the newborn infant's birth, something parallel to what we have in mind doing collectively for, uh, for, for wealth poor uh, infants <coughs> in the United States through the baby bond proposal. So there's a variety of ways in which in vivo transfers take place and those, those transfers, uh, inheritances and transfers that take place while relatives are still living are the key sources of wealth for most Americans. Everyone watching is invited to ask a question of Professor Darity. To do that, you can go to the Duke University Facebook page and post a comment there. You can also get on Twitter and tweet with the tag Duke Live or send us an email at live.duke.edu at live at duke.edu and we will ask the question of Professor Darity. Professor Darity, uh, we've been talking here about wealth disparities. In one way that you talk about this field is stratification economics. Can you tell us what does that mean, stratification economics? Uh, stratification economics is a new subfield in economics that emphasizes two themes. Uh, it borrows the notion from my, my own discipline, economics, that, uh, that individuals engage in self-interested behavior, uh, that they respond to pecuniary incentives, 
uh, that they are m motivated out of largely what we might call material self-interest. And then the, uh, the, other, the other theme that creates the fusion that I call stratification economics is the notion that's taken from sociology uh, that focuses on processes of group formation, group identity construction, and group cohesiveness. <coughs> wow, I'm having a time, but here, let me, let me soldier on. Uh, the, 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 the premise of stratification economics is that we should examine the world as a world in which there are groups that function out of self-interest. And so that, that we're in an environment in which there is, in some sense, a competition between groups. And some groups gain a position of advantage and dominance, and other groups are subjected to a position of subordination. And in that context, uh, we, have to, we have to have an understanding of how uh, resources, opportunities, and prospects for the future are, are uh, unevenly distributed in such a way that members of different groups have different kinds of opportunities and chances to, uh, to, to enjoy and fulfill their lives. Now, one lesson, Professor Darity, that you draw out of this uh, stratification economics is to challenge the American story of upward mobility. You want to talk about lateral mobility. So what's the difference between those two narratives? Okay, so the narrative of upward mobility largely has been used to describe the process of, of immigrant integration into uh, U.S. society. And that's an argument that says that uh, immigrant groups come to the United States uh, uh, in, in, a, in a position of poverty <coughs> and deprivation, and then within two generations, uh, they become disproportionately pr participants in America's middle class, so that they climb up a ladder. Uh, usually some people refer to this as an urban escalator if we think about the immigrant populations that enter into the United States through major cities like New York City. Uh, the lateral mobility hypothesis, in contrast, says that uh, the, 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 more, uh, the more typical immigrant experience is one in which uh, immigrant groups retain or restore or retrieve <coughs> the relative position that they held in their country of origin. And so that, in some sense, they're moving laterally from the social hierarchy that existed in their country of origin to the social hierarchy that exists in the United States. The United States, being wealthier than the vast majority of countries in the world, may provide a higher income that's associated with a similar relative position in the United States. And so it's a, it's a somewhat different uh, way of framing the nature of the immigrant experience to coming to America. Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've been an advocate of the view that the facts of, the, of various immigrant histories are far more consistent with the lateral mobility hypothesis than the upward mobility hypothesis. In Talking History, we have a comment here on Facebook from Mary Bateman Clark who says, not much has changed since 1821. Mm. Professor Darity. Okay. Uh, well, uh, that, I'm not sure exactly what Mary Bateman Clark means by that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the particular significance of 1821. Um, uh, 1829 was the year of Nat Turner's rebellion, uh, but I'm not sure what, what specifically occurred in 1821 that was of signal importance in terms of African American history. Um, well, it depends on what you're examining, whether or not you can make the charge that not much has changed. And it also depends upon which year is the anchor for your comparison. So, for example, if I looked at 1880, uh, the period <coughs> immediately after the destruction of Reconstruction, um, if, if I was measuring per capita income between blacks and whites, <coughs> I would get approximately the same ratio that I have today. And so one could argue that not much has changed in terms of relative economic position using that statistic between 1880 and the present. Uh, on the other hand, one could argue that a tremendous amount has changed. Uh, I think most people 
uh, treat, at least symbolically, <coughs> the election of a black president as something that's a signal of a tremendous change in America. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about how much of a change the election of a black president represents, but uh, one certainly would not think that that could have occurred in 1880, and certainly couldn't have occurred in 1821 with uh, the vast majority of the black population in the United States being subjected to slavery. Everyone <coughs> watching is invited to join into this conversation by Facebook, by Twitter or by email. Professor Darity, in speaking of President Obama, we have a question here from Jamila who asked, how should we respond when some people point to celebrities like Oprah, Will Smith, and others who are wealthy? Well, um, I mean, one, one obvious response is that, of course, there are going to be some people who are, uh, who are outliers. Uh, and that's why I focused on on, on the median households, or the median households are, are the households who are, are right in the middle of the distribution. Uh, so in some sense, the presence of individuals who are extremely wealthy or extraordinarily wealthy are at the far ends of the distribution, and they are not, they don't come into consideration when you look at the median. Now, I could use a different statistic. I could have used the mean, which would have pulled into, uh, into our configuration these very wealthiest of individuals in constructing our average. Because I think we, we want to be more concerned about the average person's situation than uh, the person who's at the extremes. Uh, but if I looked at the mean, instead of looking at the median, uh, that would have a far more dramatic effect on raising the net worth position for white households than it does for raising the net worth position of black households. <coughs> and so as a consequence, the actual, uh, the absolute monetary gap would be much, much wider. So if you'll recall, I said, uh, based on the statistics that, statistic that I reported earlier, it would take three years for the average white household, uh, for the average black household to catch up with the average white household in terms of wealth, three years of 100% savings. If we looked at mean differences, it would take four to five years for the average, white house, uh, average black household to save 100% of their, their income to catch up with the average, average uh, white household. And of course, that kind of savings behavior is an impossibility for families to be viable and stay alive. And going back to this issue of uh, immigrants and immigration, Linda asked, is it possible immigrants will leapfrog over blacks in terms of wealth? Uh, well, it, 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 it's possible. Uh, I mean, it, it already happened. <laughs> um, in in uh, towards, uh, towards the end of the Civil War and towards uh, the beginning of the Reconstruction period, one of the policies that was seriously considered, uh, temporarily implemented <coughs> on a very, very small scale, was the redistribution of land to the ex-slaves. Uh, this, is, this is the source of the, the legendary 40 acres and a mule. Uh, a claim that African Americans have made as, uh, as, as, as recompense for having been subjected to slavery. Uh, that claim was predicated factually on an actual plan that was undertaken in 1865 along the coast of Georgia and South Carolina under General Sherman's orders. Uh, it was also embodied in the first Freedmen's Bureau Act and then more substantively in the various homestead acts that were passed. Now, uh, one proviso here. The homestead acts involved largely, uh, particularly as we move into the western part of the United States, uh, the transfer of land that was previously uh, the territory of the Native American population into the hands of US, then US citizens. Well, uh, one of the premises behind that process of transfer, though, was that a significant portion of that land was supposed to go to the ex-slaves. But that didn't happen. The land was actually transferred disproportionately to newly arrived white immigrants from Europe. And so, uh, so, so there you go with uh, a first, first case of, of leapfrogging 
via the uh, manipulation of an existing legal, legal structure that was intended to support the ex-slaves. Um, so um, so let, let me just say the answer to that is yes, it's possible and, and it's already happened. Everyone watching is invited to join in the conversation here by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. Professor Darity, we're talking history and you've written about the decumulation of black wealth from 1920 on by white terrorists, fraud, theft, and the manipulative use of partition sales tactics by whites. How do you connect these disciplines of history and economics, seeing the economic effect of historical events? Well, I, I, I think I have a sense that there's um, an integration that's required across a wide range of disciplines, uh, not exclusively history and economics, but other disciplines as well, that's really important in the process of trying to gain a richer understanding of our our nation's past, its present, and its future direction. So, um, in my own work, I've I've relied heavily on uh, on on uh, the research of historians, uh, some research that I've attempted to do myself, some archival research, um, to try to get a better understanding of how we got from where we were to to where we are now particularly in the period, the critical period, I think, of transition, which were the, the Reconstruction years. Uh, I think W.E.B. Du Bois on a number of occasions referred to the period of Reconstruction as the seven mystic years where America almost became a democracy. Uh, and, and what he meant by that was those were the years in which enfranchisement of African Americans, full enfranchisement, well, of African American men, because in those days it was only men who were permitted to vote, uh, almost became a reality and almost had the effect of pr producing the, a real transformation in the way in which this society understood itself and operated and functioned. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I don't think one would have a, a real sense of the significance of those seven mystic years and the way in which that process was terminated largely by uh, white supremacist terrorist violence uh, uh, without studying history carefully. And I think one of the important books for people to look at is Alan Trelisa's book, which is called White Terror, which is a study of the origins of the initial phase of the Ku Klux Klan and the terrorist campaign to disenfranchise blacks in the South. Now, one way that you've taken history and brought it home, made it local through uh, conferences and even class assignments, is looking at the names of local buildings. So, so talk about this exercise of the history of local buildings and their names. Well, um, this was particularly important for me when I was uh, previously on the faculty at UNC at Chapel Hill. Um, and I taught a course there that was called... Uh, the uh, economic and social history of the African American presence at the University of North Carolina. Uh, it was a course that the students had said that they would like to have developed and at the time the chancellor of the university asked me if I would be willing to try to uh, develop such a course. Um, so it was student demand that produced the course and one of the things that we did in that class was we invested a significant amount of time looking at the bi biographies of the individuals for whom many of the buildings at the University of North Carolina are named after. Uh, so very, very interesting kinds of, uh, uh, of, of findings emerge from that. I mean, one of the buildings is called Saunders Hall, for example. William Saunders, who was a member of the Board of Trustees at the University of North Carolina, also uh, was uh, an instrumental figure in the uh, formation and operation of the Ku Klux Klan in the aftermath of the Civil War in North Carolina as well. So, uh, uh, so th this, got, this, this brought, my brought to my attention the significance of the way in which we memorialize individuals, how monuments are erected in memory of individuals, and uh, the further discovery that there's a number of university campuses where you can find these kinds of memorializations embedded in the naming of buildings. Uh, 
I mean, Yale University is, uh, you know, another campus where there's a virtual landscape of testimony to the uh, lost cause of the Confederacy uh, embedded in the buildings on the campus. A lot to discover right nearby. Everyone is invited to join into this conversation by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. In talking education here, Professor Darity, we have an email question here from Jeffrey who says, I want to ask about the public school system. I have two children in Durham schools and went to Baltimore public schools. What do you think needs to be done to better engage all students, but particularly African-American males in the public school system and reverse the absolutely frightening discipline and dropout rates? Okay, um, excellent question. Um, I've been inclined to argue uh, based on the evidence that's available to me and uh, particularly evidence about what I would view as successful schools, um, that the problem is embedded in the failure of schools to provide all of the young students with uh, challenging and creative instruction from the very time that they start school. In fact, one of the things that I've uh, been increasingly convinced is the case is that despite the fact that we uh, facially have desegregated schools, we still have segregated instruction and curriculum. <coughs> uh, the segregated instruction and curriculum, I think, is embodied in, uh, in the fact that we've created a, a scheme of schooling in which we have racialized tracking from the various, very earliest years of schooling. And uh, the process begins with uh, differential identification of kids for gifted and talented instruction. And uh, so, so there are more, uh, so there, there, there's a much higher rate of identification of, of, of white and Asian students for gifted and talented identification than there is for black and Latino students. In North Carolina, uh, it's about 20% of white and, and Asian students who are, are identified as gifted and talented, whereas it's closer to about 5% of, of black and Latino kids. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and that sort of starts the process. And then once we get to high school, we see these huge disparities in participation in the most challenging courses, uh, like advanced placement courses, uh, the international baccalaureate programs where they exist, honors programs, honors courses. Um, and we also, among those students who actually take those classes, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a big gap in, in performance outcomes on, on the, uh, the, the national standardized exams that are given at the end of those kinds of classes. Uh, so, so my argument is, is what we have to do is to amp up and intensify the quality of instruction uh, for all kids from the very beginning of the school years. And I think of some examples of schools that have attempted to do that locally that have had tremendous success in uh, reducing student attrition, uh, in, uh, in, in, in eliminating evidence of any kind of significant racial achievement gap. Uh, so one of these would be Southwest Elementary, particularly in the interval 1999 through 2004 in Durham. Another are the schools. Another example are the schools that have adopted a, uh, a, a wonderful curriculum that's called Project Bright Idea. Uh, these are some of the lowest income schools in the state, uh, and they're producing students who are doing extraordinarily well. This is a curricular intervention for grades K through two. Uh, so, so, so my my view is that the uh, the central solution to our educational ills, and especially uh, the racial disparity and dropout rates and academic performance is to, from the very early years, give kids a, a, a wonderful high quality education. Uh, and I think you'll, you'll eliminate the phenomenon of disengagement and, uh, and high dropout rates as a consequence. A program that often gets mentioned in the context of education reform is charter schools. Do you take a position on them? I don't have uh, a position uh, that that one way or the other. I'm, I mean, I don't see charter schools as as intrinsically a solution, uh, particularly if we don't address the question of differential access to high quality instruction and curriculum. So if if charter schools would ensure that all of our kids would get high quality instruction, 
then you know maybe they're the answer. But my focus would be on the content of instruction and curriculum, regardless of wh whether we call the school a charter or a non-charter school. Now, of course, you are a teacher yourself. Is there a teaching philosophy you have? And, and I think it'd uh, be fun to mention how you like to integrate science fiction, how that can inspire your teaching and your research. So your own approach to teaching, how would you describe that? Um, I, you know, I'm not sure I've been sufficiently reflective about my own approach to teaching. I've uh, been doing it, I guess, for close to 30 years. And so uh, I, I probably should be more reflective about it. Um, <coughs> I like to create an atmosphere in the classroom where people are comfortable about challenging me and about challenging one another. Uh, so I think there, you know, we always have to be concerned about certain norms of civility. Uh, but I, I don't think generally that's been a problem in my classes, and so. <coughs> Everyone watching is invited to join in this Office Hours conversation. If you want to ask a question, ask it now. Do it by Facebook on the Duke University Facebook page, Twitter with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Professor Darity, I think we can't leave your office hours with at least touching on the healthcare debate, uh, the issue of disparities gets brought up there regularly. Is that something that you uh, touch upon in your own research? Um, I'm only, uh, I'm, I'm beginning to touch upon that in, in, a, in a, more dis, the, a more extended way than I have in the past. Uh, I'm particularly interested in trying to have a better understanding of some very specific uh, uh, ailments uh, like adolescent obesity, uh, like uh, hypertension and, and diabetes. Uh, there's a, a young uh, economist who's a health economist who is now currently doing postdoctoral work at, at uh, University of Wisconsin, Tiffany Green, who's uh, been collaborating with me on a research project where we've been trying to examine how exposure to racism as a source of stress might be manifest in certain types of physiological changes in people's, in people's bodies that could actually trigger uh, or aggravate hypertension. Uh, so this is kind of new work that's emerging now, but uh, it, it's something that I'm interested in in trying to pursue more fully in the future. We're at your office hours, so we should mention your upcoming conferences. Can you give us a preview here? You've got Race, Sports, and Power coming up at the end of this month and then right at the beginning of next month, an African-American Economic Summit. So what should we be thinking about vis-a-vis uh, -vis these conferences? Well, uh, Race and Sports is, uh, is a conference that is organized around a theme that I've long thought would be important to, uh, to try to pursue, uh, both from a scholarly and, and just sort of an entertainment uh, perspective particularly in the triangle and at an institution like Duke where there's a, a high value that's assigned both to academic excellence and success in intercollegiate sports. So, uh, so we're going to have a variety of people show up including uh, the legendary Harry Edwards and uh, local uh, radio sports commentator Bomani Jones. Uh, and we're going to really explore, try to unpackage how sports and race have interacted in a variety of, of ways, including controversies over uh, you know, whether or not blacks have a genetic advantage as athletes, uh, differences in uh, academic outcomes in colleges and universities between uh, athletes from various ethnic and racial groups, uh, and, uh, and how race plays out in professional sports, both in terms of marketing and in terms of imaging of the individual sports. Uh, the second conference uh, is going to be on an African American Economic Summit, and our objective there is to bring together a group of African American scholars and researchers, primarily economists, to try to address the nature of the current economic crisis, what should be done about it, and what should be done about it also 
in the context of the specific kinds of traumas that have been imposed on, on the, black, the black community in America. Uh, and so we're going to have some people of particular prominence and note, note here. Uh, Julianne Malveaux, who's currently president of Bennett College and an economist, will be a participant. Ronald Johnson, who is uh, the dean of the School of Business at Western Carolina University and who is the uh, architect of a notion called the credit crumble, which is entirely relevant to the current crisis, will also be participating. Uh, and we hope to generate a, a document that will constitute a set of proposals and ideas from this conference. Professor Darity, in closing here, we've been talking big picture economics, uh, history of the African-American community. What about someone who's not an, an economist but uh, deals with money, personal finances, anything that just in our uh, daily lives, in, in the jobs, in the workplace, in our, our home budget, that you would draw our attention to? Uh, no, but I think people should be very deeply engaged in the question of uh, what type of policy our nation should pursue with respect to ensuring that all Americans have viable access to health insurance. I think that would have a tremendous effect on our home budgets and our, our pocketbooks. Professor Darity, thank you for holding these office hours. The conversation can continue online. Post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or send an email to live at duke.edu. Next week, Professor Noah Pickus will hold office hours here. He will be discussing how to break the immigration policy stalemate. To learn more about Duke, visit the newly redesigned duke.edu.